It is the 28th of March 1979. James Callaghan loses a vote of no confidence by one MP in Westminster, laying the path for a Thatcher government. And in Londonderry Township, Pennsylvania, a reactor cooling malfunction would cause the USA's most significant commercial reactor incident. As you may know, I've covered three of the four international nuclear event scale level 5 incidents on this channel. And today completes the set as we will look at the Three Mile Island incident. If you want to know more about the INES, then you can click here for a video I did about it. Don't worry, I'll wait for you. The accident would lead to cleanup efforts running well into the early 90s, costing around $1 billion. The incident, although not directly the cause, saw the end of a historic growth of the atomic energy industry in the USA, and it would spur on a growing anti-nuclear movement. In a bizarre coincidence, the event would take place only a number of days after the release of the film The China Syndrome, which is based around a nuclear reactor accident. The Three Mile Island Nuclear Generating Station, or TMI for short, up until just a few weeks ago at the time of writing this script, was a nuclear power station based in Pennsylvania, on a sandbar next to the Susquehanna River, which is here on a map. Being just three miles downstream from Middleton, Pennsylvania, with a population of around 9,000, it was decided that a nuclear power station would be beneficial to the region, being close to Harrisburg, York and Lancaster. Metropolitan Edison, owned by General Public Utilities, began construction of TMI-1 on the 18th of May 1968 a pressurised water reactor designed by Babcock and Wilcox, with a net generating capacity of 819 megawatts, going online in 1974. The reactor was built with a cost of around 400 million, which is equal to around 2 billion in today's money. TMI-1 would have a relatively trouble-free career up until 2019, apart from a couple of incidents, one of which was a radiation release into the reactor containment building, with 20 workers being treated for mild radiation exposure. Another incident involved someone driving into the site, eventually being apprehended in the turbine building, which sounds like a great subject for a future video. However, this video isn't really about TMI-1, and instead the ill-fated TMI-2. Construction began on TMI-2 on the 1st of November 1969. Unit 2 was similar in design to the original reactor, However, it boasted an increased output of 906 megawatts. Construction was delayed due to running over budget at 700 million in 1978 money. Due to delays, the reactor wasn't brought online until the 30th of December 1978. The combined power generating capacity of both TMI-1 and TMI-2 was around 1700 megawatts, or enough to electrically supply 300,000 homes. The reactor was a PWR type like TMI-1, however just four months after commissioning, disaster would strike. But before we get into that, let's look at how the reactor at TMI-2 works. Now I'm a fan of an IEA report, most of my commute is spent reading either one of those or an RAIB report. I know I live an exciting life, so because of my not at all boring reading habits, needless to say much of this video is based on the IAEA report for the Three Mile Island incident. Right, so TMI-2 reactor was of a pressurised water type, and it produced steam from heat created from fission to drive a turbine to generate electricity to be distributed to the public. The reactor used uranium oxide as its fuel source inserted into the reactor core via fuel rods, and the reactor also had control rods with a scram facility. TMI-2 used three cooling circuits. The first, or primary circuit, circulated water through the core, acting as a moderator by letting neutrons undergo multiple collisions with the light hydrogen atoms in the water. The water used in the PWR is simply ordinary water, but does not contain large amounts of deuterium, making it distinct from heavy water used in reactors like the NRX in Canada. The primary circuit picks up heat from fission and carries it out of the core to two steam generators. Inside the 30 feet tall generators, is many small diameter tubes of which primary water flows. The heat from the primary water inside the tubes is used to boil the secondary circuit of water inside the generators, creating steam being sent to the turbines. After being used to turn the turbine blades, the steam from the secondary circuit is condensed in a condenser cooled by another water circuit using the site's iconic cooling towers for use again. All the water circuits are kept separate to stop any radioactive cross-contamination, 
meaning the primary circuit is the only one to have direct contact with the reactor core. Also, to prevent the primary circuit from boiling, the water is kept at a high pressure of around 2,200 psi. Connected to the primary circuit are pressurizers filled about halfway full of water with a steam cushion on top. The pressure in the system can be controlled by either heating up the electric heaters or cooling down with a water spray on the pressurizers. This ability to change the pressure can be done either by the control system or the plant operators. To prevent overpressuring the pressurizer, a pilot relief valve is provided. If this valve is open to relieve pressure, steam and or water flows into a drain tank. To prevent the tank from overfilling, a rupture disc is provided. For redundancy, an extra valve is provided in case the relief valve becomes stuck. This extra valve is called the block valve. Several hours leading up to the accident, the operators were attempting to fix a blockage in the secondary cooling system. The system uses eight condensate polishers to filter out any minerals from the water. Any impurities in the water loop can cause premature damage to the steam generators, much like the rubbish you find in your kettle. It's not uncommon for the resin from the filters to cause blockages in the system, and are usually cleared by compressed air. However, this time the simple fix was providing more of a challenge. Compressed air was used to instead blow water through the system to try and clear it up, and in doing so, pushing water past an open check valve into an instrument airline. This would cause a vital piece of equipment to trip out. Right, let's get on to the accident. On the 28th of March at around 4 a.m., TMI 2 was operating at 97%, whilst TMI 1 was shut down for refueling. A secondary cooling system condensate pump tripped out, causing it to stop working. Lacking a water supply, the two feed pumps also tripped out. Due to the pumps on the secondary cooling system being shut down, a safety circuit automatically shut down the turbine generators. Three auxiliary feed water pumps started up as designed. These pumps should have been enough to start the turbine generators. However, a valve downstream had been left closed by an earlier test operation. Due to the auxiliary pumps not being able to pump water, the steam generators were unable to remove enough heat from the primary cooling circuit. Due to the lack of heat reduction from the secondary cooling system, the temperature in the primary system increased and subsequently expanded in volume. The expansion led to the pressurizer beginning to fill up, compressing the steam cushion inside, leading to a higher pressure in the primary system. Four seconds after the initial tripping of the condensate pump, the pressure in the pressurizer had reached such a level that the pilot relief valve opened as it was designed to do. The pressure continued to increase, leading to at around nine seconds after the initial pump trip, the control rods being inserted into the reactor, shutting down the chain reaction. The shutdown caused the pressure in the primary system to decrease. Operators were expecting this to happen, and in accordance with the rules and procedures, turned on the high pressure injection system. With the reactor shut down and the relief valve open, the pressure continued to drop off. So far, so normal. However, at a certain point, once the pressure was sufficiently low enough, the valve should have closed, stabilizing the pressure. On this occasion, however, the valve stuck open, causing more and more pressure to be lost in the system as steam and water escaped through the stuck open valve. With not enough pressure in the primary system, steam started to generate inside the reactor core, which it was not designed to accommodate, and in turn started to fill the pressurizer with water. Thinking that the system was filling with water and in accordance with their rules and procedures, the operators switched off the pressure injection system as an attempt to prevent the overflow of water. However, pressure continued to rise inside the system due to the steam buildup inside the reactor core. With the pressurizer filling with water and pockets of steam forming inside the reactor core cooling channels, the heat increased the fuel cladding temperature. The operators had a confusing event unfolding in front of them, something that they hadn't trained for, rising water level in the pressurizer and a decreasing primary system pressure. This was due to the lack of proper instrumentation inside the control room. The control room had some confusing design quirks one of which being the indicator light for the pilot operated valve. The one stuck open, allowing coolant to escape. A light was provided to signify the status of the relief valve. Light on means open, light off means closed. Well, that wasn't the case. The operators weren't aware that the light only signifies the state of the electronic solenoid as the bulb was wired to the circuit. When the valve was working correctly, the light bulb would give an indication as lack of power to the solenoid, reverting the valve to a closed state and the operators had been conditioned to think light off valve closed. However, this morning, the valve had a mechanical issue, meaning it was stuck open, 
but power had been cut to the solenoid extinguishing the indicator bulb, giving an assumed closed valve state to the operators. Whilst the confusion in the control room continued, water had begun to fill up the drain tank, eventually causing the rupture disc to burst. Water and steam from the reactor was now being ejected into the reactor building. Unknowing of this, the operators continued to try and manage the rising water level in the pressurizer. At around 80 minutes into the incident, the primary loop's four pumps began to cavitate from the water and steam mixture. To try and counteract this, the pumps were shut off. It was thought that the water would continue flowing through the core from natural circulation. However, the steam buildup in the core prevented this and in turn caused the trap water to boil itself, creating more steam. With the pumps running, there was just enough water cooling for the core. However, without this forced flow of water, there was nothing stopping the fuel from being damaged by overheating. The operators tried several different procedures to try and get a hold of the situation. However, the stuck valve was still not discovered. The fuel and the steam filled regions of the core boil dry, heating to temperatures high enough to create a chemical reaction with the zerg alloy cladding, and the steam producing as a byproduct hydrogen, which we will look at later. The failing cladding allowed uranium dioxide, a fission product, to escape, and after mixing with hydrogen, water, and steam, were expelled into the reactor building by the stuck valve and broken rupture disc. Thanks for watching part one. I'm hoping to get out part two really soon. If you get a chance, check out my Teespring store as well as my Patreon for early access to videos. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here shortly.